think all those who are sitting behind can actually come in the front and we'll have a more interactive session. So thank, thank you guys for being here. The most difficult time of the conference is after lunch <laughs> to stay awake. So hopefully this will provide enough uh, adrenaline as well as caffeine to keep us awake, at least for those of us who are passionate about developing new things. Now this particular session was designed with the orthopedic surgeon in mind because all of us at some stage have had an idea in our heads and didn't know what to do with it. Some of us have been able to take it ahead and some of us have not. So let's begin by looking at what is innovation? What is this innovation that we are talking about? So it's an unrelenting drive to break the status quo. And I think this is very important because the most dangerous thing to do is to keep the status quo, as it is said. And you have to develop something or go where others have not dared to go. And it's always intimidating in the beginning. There are numerous challenges, but most of these challenges can be overcome. So for long, if you look at this quote above, they said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, which we all orthopedic surgeons do, uh, but expecting different results. Now, I know that if we do the same surgery in the same technique, you're not going to get a different outcome. So we have to change that. And instead of maintaining status quo, I think we have to try and see how we can change the things even little. So most innovation actually does not involve anything radically different, but involves doing things we do every day a little bit better rather than creating something which is completely new and different. So we are going to talk, come back to us, orthopedic surgeon with an idea. The moment an idea comes, a lot of us try to suppress it thinking that no, 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 this is not going to go anywhere. I don't have any place where I can convert this idea into something real, into a device. But then look at this saying, what good is an idea if it remains an idea? One has to try, one has to experiment, one has to fail, and then again try. This is the only way we can change things a little bit and maybe change the world. Let's be ambitious. So what are the different challenges that come to us as an orthopedic surgeon? I think the first thing, as I said, is we don't know who to go to. Uh, all of us may not be fortunate enough to have engineer friends who can help you take this idea ahead. And we know in orthopedics, I think the first person we require is an engineer to help us model a particular implant or an instrument or a device. We think it's difficult. We Funding is always a big challenge to take this ahead into even the prototype stage. We are also intimidated by the clinical trials. And I think most of us don't have any business sense to try and commercialize this and we require a lot of help on it. And of course in that process we forget that the patent is also important and that is the only thing which, which we can keep as our own. So this session today is going to talk about all these challenges and how to overcome these challenges. And we are fortunate to have a very good faculty of people who've, who've been through this process. Professor Ravi, I'm very proud to say, uh, uh, has been my friend since 2002 when we start work, started working on the uh, clinical trials project. He's a mechanical engineer but I think now I know him as a biomedical engineer and he's, he's my go-to person for anything that uh, comes to me as an idea. And I don't think uh, life has been fair to him after I entered into his life. Uh, he, I don't think he can sleep as peacefully as he used to before, but I think it's more interesting. Life is more interesting. So, We've gone on to take on the challenges. We first tried with the prosthesis for limb salvage surgery. That uh, product is now on clinical trials. Uh, we did started it at Hinduja. We've, it's now gone on to Tata Memorial as well as Ames in New Delhi. And the clinical trials are on. Uh, 
But now, uh, because of that trial and because of the funding, we've been able to set up first an AutoCAD lab and then uh, the biotechnology incubation center at IIT Bombay. And both of us actually had this dream that we should have a place where orthopedic surgeons can just go with their ideas and convert it into something which becomes a reality. Either it, that's a device which will be useful or then we can discard it and go on to a new idea. Uh, Rupesh uh, was one of the first engineers who started working with us, got interested in what we were doing on the prosthesis. In fact, his PhD thesis was on the mega prosthesis. Can you imagine an engineer taking his PhD thesis as a mega prosthesis? Even orthopedic surgeons don't want to look at a mega prosthesis. But he got interested, he got hooked, he stayed on, and he now heads this uh, Betik Center or the Biotechnology Incubation Center. And both uh, Professor Ravi and Rupesh have been instrumental in bringing many, many ideas, not only into reality, but into commercial devices now available and marketed from companies. And they will tell you about uh, what the process has been. We are also fortunate to have Dr. Mahendre with us, somebody who spent all his life uh, working on such things, on research projects, on doing clinical trials, and we'll be asking him to take, uh, give us a little overview on what the clinical trials are and why they should not intimidate us when we develop something uh, useful and we want to prove to the world that this is something which is good and something which should be used. We also have uh, Chirag Tanna, who's a patent attorney. He will be also with us and telling us a little bit about patenting uh, any of our devices. We have two orthopedic surgeons who are going to talk to us about their foray into innovation. We have uh, Dr. Gadegone, and I think everybody knows him very well. He does not need an introduction. From small things, he's, he's, he's developed innovative devices which is actually put into clinical use and we'll hear about his innovations from him. We've got Dr. Shantanu Patil from Chennai. He's been working on bioprinters, which is another exciting area in this field, and it's going to change the way we practice our orthopedics, and we'll listen to him as well. We also have Manish Deshmukh from Merrill to represent the companies, because no device is going to be successful unless there's a company to take it ahead. So he's going to talk to us about the industry perspective. So I'm going to hand over now to Professor Ravi to talk to us about the valleys of death. An engineer is going to talk to us about death. No, super beginning, Dr. Manish, as usual. Yeah, he's right. I mean, it was life became difficult, but interesting. But about peace part, actually, people have said that uh, and faculty life, normal faculty life is not easy, you know. And I have actually had people coming to me saying, you must be sleeping very peacefully because what you're doing is useful to the world. So there you are on that part. So um, just a quick perspective I thought I should give you. At this point of time, uh, India has a huge healthcare industry uh, represented by not just hospitals, but medical tourism, manufacturing, and so on. And it's also one of the largest employers. So this is how I convince government to, to put more money into, into healthcare. And government is putting more money into R&D as well. And all the ministry budgets have gone up almost twice, thrice, and so on. And um, the particular market about Indian medical devices is going by leaps and bounds. I think 15, 18% CAGR growth year after year. Um, it's now almost, they said, $10 billion right now. But 80% we are importing from other countries, mostly USA, Germany, and so on. But if you look at the per capita expenditure, that is where it hurts because our uh, per head expenditure of healthcare is less than 1% of USA from where we are importing all the equipment. So we cannot just rely on those. Even if you give 90% discount, it's still not affordable to the even the average Indian. Forget about bottom of the pyramid. So Manish mentioned this uh, mega processes, tumor knee processes. That is the first picture. On the top was when I saw the first surgery, uh, an imported one but not being done by Manish in 2003-2004. And the second picture is where we are, we are putting our own device. 2004 to 2019 has been a, quite a ride, I must say, 15 years. But I, let me also say that very, very few faculty have the perseverance to, to work for 15 years on one project. 
And it was not one project, we have multiple projects, funding from different sources, government, industry, our own pockets. Uh, but I think we are very proud that what we have at the end is world-class processes, world-class materials, manufacturing, but designed for Indian anatomy. We're very proud about that. It has better functionality than the imported ones. So this was our story. And then, of course, uh, the government of Maharashtra came to me and saying, one device in 15 years is not going to solve. Why don't you put a system in place to do more per year? But then we realized that the whole journey is very challenging. And this is one thing which uh, you ought to know. That when you have a define a need, and let's say you have the basic seed of an idea or a concept, uh, the first thing you do is to create a proof of concept. Otherwise, how will you people understand what you're talking about? So create a, something with clay, a play dough or jugard materials to do that, which you can do it in an R&D lab as well. And many of us write a paper and then say our job is done for society. Some of us go one step ahead and say, okay, let's build a working functional prototype so we can demonstrate the functionality. Not yet ready to put on a patient, but at least you can showcase how it works. And some of us write a file a patent and say, our job is now really done, and let industry come forward. If someone takes it uh, across the third valley of death and creates a actual marketable, commercially viable, viable product, and you make 10, 15, 20 pieces and actually distribute and actually start into clinical trials, well, that is a great point, and that's when you can even license it to an industry or a startup. But then the final value of death is when you actually start manufacturing in large numbers and marketing that and create a sustainable market success story. Okay? That's what is called, called a scale-up. Now, I just put numbers uh, roughly for every thousand papers that we write, maybe there are 100 patents filed. For every 100 patents, maybe we are creating 10 products and maybe for 10 products, maybe one is creating a success story, which is selling on a regular basis. The amount of funding that you need is 10x at every stage. Again, these are rough numbers, so you can get some picture in the mind. I've been trying to convince governments and institutions that can we just shift a little bit of effort onto the right side, and let's create a little more success stories and impact. But that is where impact comes. If you are thinking which is the worst or the deadliest de value of death, it is the third one, because converting a research prototype into a marketable product, no one wants to do, neither academia nor industry. That's what we are trying to focus on in large numbers. So to overcome that, what we have been doing in the last few years is to create a process in place where we define a problem, which is an idea to invention, to innovation, to impact. This was one of the other success stories that we had. A, uh, there was a doctor, rural doctor who said that I'm not able to, uh, I don't want to send the patient for a second opinion. I want to send the sound of the patient's chest. And that is how the whole idea of a smart stethoscope was born. born. And for 200 ideas that we created in the lab, only about 10 have now reached the market. So failures are there, but early failures are, are inexpensive. You want to minimize the later failures in life. So today we have uh, now a whole host of uh, devices, head to toe, uh, from screening devices, uh, diagnostic devices, surgical instruments, assistive devices, you see the whole thing. The red line words are the names of the startup companies. Most of them by the innovators themselves who said, let me do it myself, okay? And now because of this, many small and medium companies are coming to, coming to us saying that, can you become our R&D house? And can you develop the products further? We know the market, we have the manufacturing, but we don't have R&D. Can you become our R&D house? So with these words, let me stop here. And let me also hear other uh, members. But the idea is that uh, there is a way forward. And uh, we are able to demonstrate that it is possible to create, take the ideas all the way from the lab to, to land for impact. Thank you very much. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I uh, my name is Chirak Tarna. I am the founder of Inc. ID. I run an intellectual property rights firm. So under intellectual property rights, basically, uh, it's an umbrella terminology where we cover patents, trademarks, copyrights, designs. The most essential things for surgeons or doctors that you would want to know is uh, when to file. Uh, and uh, f most important aspects of intellectual property rights are patents and uh, designs. The differentiation uh, between the two. So Betek is almost uh, family for me. So we have done all the devices that you saw have gone through me. We have filed 50 plus patents granted, uh, a lot of them in more than 73 plus countries now. 
so getting to an enforceable patent or getting to a patent application which is commercializable or which is which you are able to sell which you are able to defend that is the key differentiator and that is what we bring to the uh, table so we engage with uh, inventors and doctors very early on in their uh, journey the first thing that you need to understand is fact versus uh, fiction uh, what the moment you have an idea it could be a fictional idea fictional ideas cannot be protected in whatever form there is no intellectual property right that protects fictional ideas fictional ideas in the form of a story book can go under copyright acts but that is not applicable here so the moment you start converting an idea into a physical format so in your cases it could be uh, artificial intelligence systems it could be point of care uh, diagnosis systems it could be uh, instrumentation obviously that's the biggest uh, thing that surgeons would stumble upon the moment you start that idea starts shaping uh, taking shape it starts becoming fact and then the various protocols of whether what uh, bucket of intellectual property right it fits in that comes into picture so the first thing that we say is whether it's an abstract idea or is it an enabled idea the moment there is an abstract idea but you feel that it is plausible that there is a plausible problem that you are solving or there's a plausible solution towards a, a problem that you're solving you should think about starting, uh, I mean, uh, filing a patent application or a design application. So you can come and talk to somebody like me, uh, who knows the lay of the land, who can guide you through the process. Three important things. So we work backwards. You know, when if you come and talk to me and tell me that you know, hey, I have an idea and this is what you know, I have done 10,000 surgeries or 5,000 surgeries, and time and again I have been using this device, but there are problems. Problems uh, of devices can be that it does not reach a certain place or there is less dexterity or your uh, arm hurts or your wrist hurts. And now you have an improved device which scores over and above those uh, problems, which gives you advantages which are solving those problems. That is when you think of filing a patent application or for filing an uh, intellectual property right around it. So we first figure out whether are you bringing an advantage to the table. Now this advantage has to be global in nature. You cannot just say that you know this device is there uh, in the US and they are selling it for 10 lakh rupees. I have an Indian manufacturer, the same device I'll make it for 1 lakh rupees. That is not applicable, it does not go, you can do it, uh, maybe you can make a business out of it, but it does not fall under intellectual property rights. You cannot get valid protection uh, of intellectual property rights under it. So the advantage has to be global in nature. Nobody should have seen that advantage anywhere in the world. And then we work backwards. Now that the advantage is fixed, we figure out what was the problem that you were solving. What were other devices doing? What were other point of care systems doing? Uh, were they not fast enough? Were they providing a lesser advantage? We figure that out. And then the solution that your brain has applied into solving the problem and bringing about a technological advantage, the solution bridges the gap between these two. And then for that solution only, you can get an intellectual property right around it. Now again, for uh, surgeons and this audience, there are two forms of intellectual property rights. One is patents and design registrations. If you have to protect the uh, shape of something, you know, the look and feel of something, like an iPhone, where it was just a rectangular phone with one button early on, there the shape was important. It goes under design registrations. So uh, different kinds of uh, devices where, uh, so, so I remember one suture anchor we had done, where only the shape was important. Uh, implants, where again shape is important. All that can go under designs. Pretty straightforward, you can get to an effective grant within one year. Patents are the most complicated beast of the lot, where you have to, you can protect the functioning logic and construction of something. So wherever there are moving parts, it essentially can fit under the ambit of uh, patent law. These three are the, uh, these things, you know, and uh, so when, you know, uh, this, these are the three takeaways that I would like to uh, say that you know you must file before you publish that is the biggest thing here you must establish your filing date do your search come and talk to people like us we will give you the lay of the land and we'll tell you how to proceed but you cannot go public before your filing if you go public if you have publications before your filing your own publication defeats your own novelty right. yeah so i'll stop here Good afternoon all, I'm Dr. Rupesh Khair, I'm Senior Executive Officer at BETIC. Uh, what Professor Ravi mentioned, BETIC stands for Biomedical Engineering Technology Innovation Center. And this center is at IIT Bombay. So 
as Dr. Manish said, that innovation can be done. You're the frontline people who face these problems and can think, why not solve this problem? That's how it starts. Uh, Professor Ravi, who mentioned that, how do you develop a device? What is the process? What are the uh, key steps? What are the valleys of death where it happens? My part here is that having done, say, mechanical engineering, master's in bioengineering, and now PhD on medical device testing, filed patents, and also being part of startups, I think there's sufficient knowledge, information that I've gathered in some last few years that if you want to take that idea to actually reality, what could be the key, key ingredients? What the other speakers mentioned, I have three more lines to add to it. One is going to be about that what is your role? Now the bubbling would have started. I have an idea, I can file a patent, I can develop a product, but then what is your role is what I would like to speak about here, uh, where you could contribute. The second part is, who are others that will be required for you to do that? It's not just you, but who are the other people who will require? And the last and most important part, the funds related to this. So let me try and see if I can cover in three minutes this part. This is what we call our happy pictures. So the devices which Professor Ravi mentioned that we have developed about 30 devices, functional devices, 10, 16 startups. These are the devices where in each picture there's a doctor, there's a device, there's an engineer, and there's a patient also somewhere. But we call this happy where the device has reached the people. So this is satisfactory. This keeps us that peace, sound, sleep at night. But role-wise, if you see, there are four roles that you as doctors, clinicians, physicians can play. One is that define an unmet need, where identify that problem. You are on the front line. You know what is the issue. Define it very well. Second part is where you can give feedback if somebody comes with a concept or somebody says the engineer friends decide, design something. Give the feedback there that this can be improved. This is more ergonomic. I cannot do it laterally. You'll have to do something which is autoclavable. All this is feedback which is very important for engineers. Otherwise, they do not know what to do with it. Third part is, okay, if the device is developed, you can play an important part in the clinical studies, showing that there is a clinical evidence to show that there is significance of this device which is going to be useful for people and that has to be well-documented and systematic approach. So the third part, which is the clinical studies, you can play a role. And the last is, be the early adopters because innovations need these early adopters who say that not after 10 years, once the innovation is done, I will see if it is working well, then I'll adopt. Be that early adopters, take that risk also, somebody else innovation. Then the ecosystem gets developed. You could be not only for your own idea, all the four rules, define it, uh, give the feedback, do the study and make sure you adopt it. You can be four for anybody else also. So that's the role of a clinician community or doctor community you can play. The second part, in case uh, you're wondering who all are required if I want to develop a medical device. So primary, uh, you may need an engineering institute is what we thought we should be doing. Hence, we try to put this slide that when we develop devices, we realize who are the stakeholders. So we realize that engineering institutes or academic institutes are a good stakeholder, which are required for the technology part. Government is a second stakeholder, which comes with funding, policies, and making sure it large scale public healthcare gets affected. The third is hospital community, doctors, physicians, clinicians, all of you being part of being able to adopt it, try it, create the uh, impact that is necessary. And industry, which is important, which was earlier a missing part, the startups and the medical device manufacturer who make sure that this idea comes to reality. So these are four major stakeholders. So government only not for funding, but regulations, uh, institutes for research and development, and industry for manufacturing and marketing, and then hospitals for the definition and validation. Apart from these, there are four other stakeholders that are equally important. You need incubators where startups can actually function, they can start, they get the basic space, their early time or period of that nurturing happens at an incubator, business incubators or technology incubators. There is additional uh, one more stakeholder which is investors. You need people who have money or who want to use uh, money to the right use for public health or for good or for business also in that sense. You need NGO partners who can actually make sure these innovations reach to masses and at scale. So these may be societies, uh, orthopedic society could be there, Wairoc itself could be one of these people, who play an important role in reaching this innovation to the people it was designed for. And the last is we need media friends who can cover and make sure that innovation is happening in India. And the last start, uh, slide, which is about the funding part, as Professor Ravi mentioned, the valleys of death. You have a concept, proof of concept, prototype. Um, MVP is a minimal viable product and market and it reaches to the expansion. At each stage, you roughly require this kind of uh, amount that we have seen, about one lakh for just a basic proof of concept, 10 lakh for a prototype, one CR. As you go from startup to scale up, this is the kind of funding it increases, the amount increases about roughly a zero. 
but you have different sources of funding you have public funding sources which is for betterment of public academic labs are there grants and awards are there and csr money as well as you have private funds uh, family and friends come at an early stage angel investors at an early stage where they take a risk but they take a bigger stake venture capital when their business is working this traction private equity when the business has to scale up and ipo when it has to really reach the mass scale that is required one last message i would say that uh, what we read right now is clinician led medtech ventures for better outcomes and uh, operational control which means that it should not be that engineers should be the entrepreneurs one message you can think about can doctors be the entrepreneurs and docpreneurs can be there or doctorpreneurs can be there medpreneurs can be there that is something which you will have to come out can you create a fund which is 10 doctors orthopedic doctors onco surgeons say we put a fund together we don't depend on this uh, pace at which government funding comes or uh, the tags which a private funding comes you can create your own fund to create that idea to reality and then other mediums and mechanisms can be used to scale it up but that's all from my side thank you very much look forward good afternoon everybody and uh, now i'm shifting to the clinical side we talked a lot about the innovation part of it but what seems really overwhelming to many of us is how do actually all those innovations which have happened at the lab level are brought into practice and that's where the clinical trials become critically important it is important to understand that there are regulations but it is also important to understand that with training and exposure we can do clinical trials it is not something which is where we are untrainable everybody can be trained in that and we do have professional help expertise available which can help us to sell through this whole process easily so let us not get intimidated that the first message i would like to give there are a couple of things which i am sure you would remember your epidemiology way back in third mbbs or fourth mbbs whatever it is now where we were taught about phase 1 2 3 4 uh, clinical trials here what basically it talks about is the fact that we have to take a particular product here we are talking in terms of devices and products so we have to take them through safety first then we have to prove the efficacy eventually so this whole process is of phase 1 2 and 3 trials eventually seeing them in the real market a real life scenario is what we call as a phase 4 trial that's the experience which we gain there these trials in the devices sector or instrument sector are little different and tricky why is because many a times this instrument exposure to instrument is really very clear there is nothing like blinding a typical strength of any clinical trial is in its uh, ability to blind a particular person so that bias can be minimized that happens at the level of patient that happens at the level of the investigator that doesn't happen in case of the such kinds of devices that's one second thing is what we call as a learning curve over a period of time a person who is using this particular instrument becomes more and more proficient and so his acumen in ac doing a particular procedure for example improves outcomes improve over a period of time that's another problem with this then if there are multiple operators which who are working on this there could be variations happening in them and that could in itself also lead to some kinds of problems and more importantly well we have come up with a prototype we have started working on it but that particular device may itself fail because of a very variety of reasons during the trial itself and then it poses serious challenges here therefore it is important that whenever we talk about trials these the first line talks about data safety monitoring boards or they are also called as data monitoring uh, committees i'm sorry for the typo dmcs or safety review boards these are the kinds of boards that are established they look at very carefully what a, what is happening with respect to this clinical trial use as uh, the devices are being tested in various human beings they very clearly look at the safety component part of it very well they also look at the efficacy component part of it because if safety is getting endangered by any reason or by any means the trial has to stop efficacy part of it if efficacy gets if we had in a trial we had to enroll 300 participants but if it efficacy gets proved at the level of 100 through an interim analysis there is ethically uh, it is not correct to continue the trial for 200 more because we can offer this benefit to people right then and there these kinds of decisions are taken by data safety monitoring board or uh, the safety review boards and so an interim analysis could be an answer 
One very hazy aspect which also is important whenever we talk about devices is endpoint assessment sometimes becomes difficult. The designs are very complex and the two people can have very different opinions about the outcomes if we are talking about. And so uh, there is an unblinded study design here. There are global or cultural differences in acceptability or feasibility. They are also uh, there. And sometimes the endpoint uh, of interest differs from the investigator's therapeutic capacity as well. Uh, also, there are sometimes subjective evaluations like imagine and adoptive designs which make the interpretation difficult. So in such situation, the endpoint adjudication requires to be done by calling experts specifically to give opinion. I'm not going to get into that clear-cut definition of uh, medical devices, but medical devices have been defined clearly by the regulators and a CDACO, Central Drugs Standards Control Organization, provides this guideline. But they could be anything. It just is not the device, but anything which is accompanying the device for introduction into the human beings also is considered as a accompaniment of the or accessory. And so they are classifiable anywhere between low to low uh, to moderate risk to high risk and there are two distinct types one is a medical device and other is in vitro diagnostics for both of these whenever we try to, to think about innovations we do need very specific regulatory uh, compliance and so that which is defined uh, by taking the approval from the central licensing authority which is the central drugs control organization then also registering uh, getting the approval from the ethics committee registering with the central uh, trial uh, the registry of india ctri and then very recently in 2019 the whole drug trial scenario has changed in india when we have new drugs and clinical trials and rules 2019 and we have to comply by that so uh, what I would just like to conclude with this is the main challenges uh, are because of complex designs, variations in measurement, the inability to blind the subjects. Pauses may be necessary even if we have started a trial because some, suddenly the regulators may ask for a long-term data. And uh, on the ones who have already been enrolled before the permission can be given for the others. And uh, so trials of devices and in vitro uh, diagnostics they are classified as, which can be classified as low, moderate or risk. They require approvals from the drug authority and a very stringent compliance to the national regulatory requirements. Thank you very much. Yes, I am not a very um, innovator amongst you all, but it's just a modification and restructuring of the methods that are devised in uh, orthopedic practice. So my objective of presentation is how new approach of innovation for the utilization of cost-effective orthopedic devices without violating the principle of evidence-based medicine. So I changed my thought process after my graduation, post-graduation and fellowships in foreign countries. I thought when I started private practice in a rural area and only uh, this uh, meeting only a poor patient, it's very difficult to practice with the advanced knowledge and advanced instrumentation. So orthopedic to suit the need of poor rural setup innovation in implants, lateral thinking, awareness, and jugard in limited budget and infrastructure. So my innovations, I have devised short proximal femoral nail, augmentation of PFN, screw intramedial nail for forearm fracture, for clavicle fractures, suprapatellar nail for TBL fracture, GPS nail, that is also known as Gardegone Pandya Sivsankar nail, integrated wires for lower end radius fracture, flower technique for proximal humerus fracture, Eiffel tower technique for distal humerus fractures, and so on. So just it is a modification of the technique. And I will touch only the proximal femoral nail, a most promising implant devised in 1996 by Synthes 
proximal diameter 17 mm, screw diameter 11.5 mm, and 6.4 mm length 24 millimeter, and dis dynamic distal or static locking. So modified and extensively popularized by myself and Dr. Sivay Shankar, a shall I shall concentrate mainly on IT fractures. A newly designed Indian version, PFN with reduced proximal diameter of 15 mm, screw size 8 mm, 6.5 mm, stabilizing screw distal locking, and device to suit the anatomy of Asian population with the help of a Yogeshwar implant. So this is a classical proximal femoral nail, and I published this paper on 100 cases in 2007 in a Sikhart journal, and this is well appreciated all over the world. So then I thought that the 250 or 240 mm nail crosses mid-diaphysis where angulasis is maximum, and we are all dwarf people. We are not a very tall people like European people. So what has happened? A constant thigh pain and forceful insertion leading to the shaft fracture and fragmentation of trochanter. And literature also supports that mismatch between the PFN and medullary canal causing difficulty in nailing of a protrochantric fracture. So I redesigned in 2005 when there was no short proximal femoral nail available in the world, but we have not patented it because we did not know how to do this thing. And this is how it is now a properly known as a short proximal femoral nail, a minimal invasive surgery, and you can do with the two small incision, proximal as well as distal locking. And this is also published in Asia Pacific Journal in 2010. So another a unstable trochanteric fracture to address lateral wall instability. And then again, I modified the instrument and put an anterior a screw that is known as a, a augmentation screw. And now the nails are available with the augmentation screw device with self, but we have published this paper way back in 2015. So these are all examples, just a minute, and you can see here how a perfectly you can restore the anatomy. And then again, there was a, some problem and issues of lateral wall combination. So we devised the trochanteric buttress place combined with proximal femoral nail for unstable intertrochanteric fracture. And this is the idea mooted by Sashikant Ganjale from Solapur. I assisted him and we also published this paper in the Open Journal of Orthopedic in 2018. So Albert Sain, Einstein says the whole science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. Take him, Moses. There is an urgent need for a new approaches to lower the cost and improve the outcome in the benefit of larger population. Thank you very much. So good afternoon. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about what my experiences have been with innovation. Uh, so uh, as an orthopedic surgeon who has been working on cartilage tissue for a very long time, just a very brief primer on the complex biomechanical properties of the osteochondral unit. All of you are probably familiar with how complex a structure the uh, articular cartilage is. And I have been trying to reproduce it or replicate it in the lab scenario for quite some time. <laughs> Tissue engineering, by principle, sounds very simple. You obtain cells, put them in a physiological environment, allow the cells to proliferate. They will produce matrix. Uh, and hopefully, they'll preserve the phenotype, which you can then use it in a functional manner in wherever you want to use it. Correct? Uh, and we've been doing this for quite some time, at least uh, uh, since the early 90s it's been going on. Uh, cell pellet culture is probably one of the commonest way to do it. And uh, you can see if you add. Uh, uh, some, some chondrogenic factors, you can actually improve the quality and yield of the chondrocytes which you're creating. Uh, so tissue engineering over a period of time has progressed from sheets to pellets to 3D culture in agarose or alginate. Uh, we have used hybrid scaffolds with biomimetic properties, uh, PLA, hydroxyapatite, polycaprolactone. We've used different approaches like using electrospinic nanofibrous mats with chondrogenic factors to help improve the yield and the quality of the cartilage. And yet, in spite of all of this, uh, 
the architecture we get is less than optimal. It's not, uh, you know, good enough to be put into a patient uh, to have a sustained, continuous, and replicable result. So what if we can make the cells and the matrix go in the exact place we want and in the exact concentration that we desire it to be? And of course, just around the time when we were working with this, uh, in my previous uh, employment in San Diego, California, uh, 3D bioprinters had just come into vogue. And we started using 3D bioprinters for, uh, uh, for printing meniscus, right? Uh, 2015, I moved back to India. And I thought, you know what, I should do the same thing in, in my lab in uh, Chennai, in uh, SRM. Uh, commercial ex machines are bloody expensive, right? Uh, 1.5 lakhs was just to start off it, and plus your you know, added expenses, which goes on to a long time. Obviously, for somebody who has just come back, nobody was willing to give me that money to do something of that kind. Uh, so I decided, you know what? I'll make it myself, right? Uh, how difficult can it be? Uh, and uh, I actually went ahead and uh, recruited a bunch of students in my university uh, to come and help me do this. And uh, this is just a, a uh, the first prototype which we built, right? It was essentially a syringe pump uh, which you use in the anesthesia. Uh, the anesthesia is used very commonly. We dismantled that, used a syringe pump. We took an old 3D printer which was not working, rejigged it, uh, rewrote the uh, software for it, and then for a proof of concept used Alginate uh, to see how we can do uh, a pr printing job with it. Uh, we used everything off the shelf. It was everything which was available. Um, it cost us 1 lakh 20,000 rupees to do this entire thing. And by the end of about four, four and a half months, we had a working prototype, uh, this time-lapse thing, and we can print a scaffold the way we want it, with the various thickness we want it, and the shape which we want it, right? Uh, so I'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, and then what happened was uh, uh, the pandemic struck. Uh, so, so everything came to a you know, uh, sudden stop. Uh, however, my boys were not, uh, you know, they didn't want to leave it aside. So we entered that to the uh, National Innovation Contest, which is run by the government of India, and they won the first prize for that. Uh, uh, and now the government of India is now funding us to the tune of 40 lakh rupees uh, to help us build the second prototype. Uh, and uh, we are now experimenting with various different kinds of syringes, different kind of uh, delivery systems. Uh, this was the f uh, second prototype which we have built right now. Uh, it will have two uh, different uh, uh, syringe uh, pumps are, are working simultaneously. So we can have two different materials, or we can have one, one, one syringe delivering the bio wing, the other delivering the cell type, whichever you want to do it. And uh, this is the final version. Uh, we actually launched it recently at the, uh, at the 3D printing con con conference called Amtech. Uh, and uh, it, surprisingly, the biggest uh, interest in it was not from orthopedic surgeons or dental surgeons, but the pharma industry. Uh, they are actually looking at it as a tool for using it in high throughput uh, drug research. Uh, and uh, well, we go where the money takes us, I guess, at some point in time. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we are looking for funding to scale. So if anybody here is interested, please do contact me and uh, we'll have a talk about it. Uh, so the take home message here is that, as already pointed out by much more experienced people than me, is from ideation to product to pro prototype to product is a very long road. Uh, we need indigenization, and it's not just to local clinical demands. Even on the lab and research side, we do need a lot of indigenization to happen. All the equipment and research stuff which we use is all imported. It's time we start making them in India as well. Uh, innovation is equal part creativity and equal part discipline. Uh, you can tolerate failure, but you cannot tolerate incompetence in this. Uh, so I'm. As, apart from being the uh, head for translational medicine and research at SRM Medical College, I'm also the associate director for the SRM Innovation, Incubation, and Entrepreneurship Center. And uh, I, uh, I would welcome any collaborations or anybody who's wanting to be a part of my incubator. I will be glad to talk to you guys. Though I'm not from Mumbai, I'll, I'll, I'll take you there. Thank you so much. I guess this ends what the whole thing is. And the last yeah, one is money share. Good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, enough has been said how the innovation pipeline follows. Well, from industry perspective, I must uh, point out here that it's our job to actually find out what can be commercialized, what will make value for the company. And then obviously, everything falls in place the moment you have patient in the forefront. So that's been our philosophy, and I'll just take you through the same process almost, like you know, everything begins with an idea. And then a little bit of medical device market in India. So 
uh, you know, it has grown from almost 2 billion in 2009 to 4 billion, which is like 25,000 crore, with a CAGR of almost 16%. And by, this is a market figure of 2015. And it accounts just about 1.7% of the global uh, medical device market. And then India is one of the top 20 global device markets and fourth largest in Asia Pac. So this was the old story, this is the latest story, 15 to 20, this five years, it has grown from 3.8 to 8.16 billion. And the best part is the device industry in India has grown exponentially across all verticals. Why do, why do we do that? As I mentioned, you know, uh, innovation and a new product is a main growth driver for any company. So what is the medtech R&D scenario for it? India's medtech ecosystem is changing and rapid technological advancements are opening new avenues for progress in healthcare industry. Meaningful innovation can take many forms, such as novel approach to making a product useful for, to applying a growing technology to a real world problem. So every time it was stressed by previous speakers, you need to have a problem statement and then talk about a solution. Um, at present, you can see that India's R&D spending in medtech is just around 0.6% of the GDP. However, Make in India story is definitely pushing and, you know, need to develop a research ecosystem that attracts investments from both domestic and international players. From idea to product, I know there have been multiple slides on this, but yes, understanding is the need of the hour, and that's what we do. We get, we get a lot of ideas, we filter them to a great extent and then uh, it, it, it is the problems uh, which are at times faced by orthopedic surgeons in day-to-day -day practice while treating patients in operation room. The feedback from surgeons helps us, like as an industry, to work out solutions and bring on table best product to assist medical fraternity in a better way. What we say here is it is all about collaboration, so synergy to make healthcare better and improve patients' uh, quality of life. Uh, I think it has again been stressed earlier, design, develop, deliver, your innovation, so you know it is concept development, advancement, advanced development, product development, industry. Again, uh, you know, there is a business, technology, and supply, all three angles to it. This is a very busy slide, but yes, we do follow all these stages, stage A, stage B1, B2, stage C1, stage C2, and finally the stage D. Easier way to understand this is market research, ethnography, and literature survey, patent evaluation, so on and so forth. I mean, I'll not go through all the details because it has been simplified and say, said by my earlier speakers. What we do, is what I wanted to again say here. We have about 120 people team who does only clinical. We have an established R&D center. One, we have it in Wapi corporate. Uh, we have an office in IIT Chennai campus. We also have uh, one in Philadelphia, our US facilities. Uh, <clears throat> We have association with some of these testing facilities uh, because they are mighty expensive. You might as well uh, give it to outside agency to do it. Endolabs, Element, this is in Cincinnati. ORL, you all might have heard about Seth Greenwald. We also have regulatory and patent personnel working in-house. 3D printers for R&D, prototyping, all these things are available. Just a quick two, three examples of what we have done with Professor Nagi's inputs. Uh, we have developed this. This, pay, this plate is almost uh, through with the clinical trials. Uh, it's a good uh, trochantric plate for per-trochantric, inter-trochantric, trochantric fractures. We believe that this could be the next revolution in total knee replacements, and uh, currently it is undergoing clinicals. We have developed this particular product, SIMS, um, Dr. Vijay C. Bose. It's the world's first monoblock as well as modular revision stem system. I create new products and services because where one sees a problem, I see a solution. Thank you very much for your patience.